Okay. Uh, so, um, thank you very much. Uh, this is a so this is a third uh, paper in the, this long-run project that we are doing uh, on uh, economic history of Kazakhstan at the late 19th, early 20th century with Catherine. Um, and uh, this project looks at the change in the social structure in this period. So um, I will uh, talk about the motivation and the historical context and data, and then Catherine will present the results and, uh, and the theoretical discussion towards the end. So uh, this is still preliminary work, so we're very happy to have uh, your, your comments and suggestions. The motivation for this paper comes from a development economics side where there's a now large literature that established the key role played by extended family institutions and kinship networks. Uh, so there are several well-known surveys by Cox and Fafshan, Eliana Ferrara, and Kaiva Munshi. And um, various papers have shown the importance of these informal institutions at very diverse context throughout the developing world. So India, China, Mexico, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and more. Um, the findings are not always the positive ones, so not only these institutions serve to solve some of the failures of markets or uh, the lack of the state, but also sometimes have a negative effects, uh, things like limiting entrepreneurship, uh, to which some of the uh, people in this audience have contributed uh, with research. Um, However, if you take the historical perspective, you know, historic, historians take almost for granted as a starting point of historical research that institutions are not fixed in time, but they evolve. Um, and here, um, a very useful classification is given by Gerard Rolland in his 2004 paper, which, who divides the slow-moving formal institutions, uh, sorry, slow-moving informal institutions versus fast-moving formal ones. Okay, so for example, things like political regimes, he says, change very quickly, sometimes overnight, uh, while things like culture and beliefs take much longer. Now, uh, if one focuses on family institutions, uh, including extended family, the um, historians, um, often outside economics, uh, but not only, have been concerned with the evolution of family institutions and the role of economic factors behind it for a long time. So well-known work by uh, Jack Good in 1983. Avner has written on it in his 2006 book. But it's only recently that economists have started to look at the things like adaptability and flexibility of household and family structures. So um, it's fair to say that the traditional family institutions, um, in particular change in them, is still understudied uh, in economics. So we don't yet have very good um, answers to the questions like how do they change, in which dimensions, what drives this change, and how quickly does this change occur? So um, ideally, for, for, for studying this, um, one would need a panel data where you, one would have measures of institutions and also measures of behavior, preferably at micro level, but then also the episodes uh, of large-scale exogenous change that can serve as an impetus for, uh, for, for change in, in institutions. Uh, needless to say, the, this kind of combination of data is, is rare, and we're lucky to have some, and uh, this is what we do. So we focus using our data set on, 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 um, from colonial period of Russia and in Central Asia, in particular in, in, in Kazakhstan, on extended family and clan institutions, which played enormous, uh, uh, enormously important role in that period uh, at the late 19th, early 20th century. So we document how these institutions adapted and changed in response to colonization by Russian peasants. In particular, we document changes in the identification of Kazakhs with their clans, uh, residential organizations, so in particular the size of extended families, and on production relations within the extended families, so things like individualization of production and uh, property and use rights and development of labor markets. And finally, towards the end of the paper, we explore, uh, we start to explore the, how observed changes can be explained and be understood as responses, rational responses to a new economic environment. So our story in a nutshell, the Russian immigration, which happened in two waves, brought the transfer of agricultural technology, so sedentary agriculture uh, Russians that migrated into Kazakhstan brought some knowledge of agricultural technology towards the Kazakh pastoralists. Uh, on, on, the, on the downside, however, there was also massive increase in land pressure in, in Kazakhstan. So Kazakhs had to switch from nomadic pastoralism, which had to rely on extensive uh, tracts of land, to semi-sedentary mixed economy, which used less land. And during this period, we show that the accompanying 
changes where Kazakh started to identify strongly with lower levels of clan structure in, in, the, in the clan genealogies, so subclans rather than the clans. The size of extended families increased, while household size remained roughly constant. The property and use rights on valuable plots became more individualized within the extended families. And finally, labor markets, uh, when the payment was made, at least in part in money, developed rapidly within the extended families, but also beyond it. Okay, so, uh, and we think that one hypothesis is that it was evolution away from traditional forms of solidarity within clans and extended families towards more, uh, you know, salary-based contracts. So historical context, I, I'll be very quick here. So I'm omitting a lot of details which are in the paper. So 1861, abolition of serfdom in Russia um, creates a lot of landless peasants, which increases the problem of land uh, in the European part of Russia. So uh, by 1870s, this is the beginning of Russian peasant in migration to Kazakh steppes. It was quote unquote illegal migration, it was not authorized. Um, but by 1890s, the government starts to realize that it might be actually a nice solution to the land tensions in the European part, so therefore it decides to put this a little bit in order. For our luck, it finances a statistical expedition in 1985, uh, headed by a prominent Russian statistician, Russian-Ukrainian statistician, uh, Fyodor Andrei Sherbina, who did an excellent job in covering essentially, you know, his expedition covered 12 provinces in northern, central, and eastern Kazakhstan, uh, um, with the data, you know, constructing data set that I, that I tell you about in a second. Um, the results of this, so the objective of this petition was to measure how much land can be taken for peasant resettlements. Uh, under the assumption of this third expedition that Kazakhs maintained their nomadic pastoralist life. Uh, this was the assumption that the uh, Tsarist administration didn't like too much. And they said, okay, recalculate everything by assuming now these guys settle. So they send a second expedition in 1907-1913, uh, so therefore we have a panel. That's essentially how the panel was constructed. Uh, that covered 10 out of the 12 original um, um, uh, provinces. So, uh, so this is the map of Kazakhstan of the period. So um, Russian peasant migration came from the northwest towards the center in the east. And uh, here um, I'm showing in, in the circles, so in, in the squares, the provinces from which we, we use the data. So the continuous line is the only province for which we have matched micro-level panel, while we're using aggregate data for, for other six, okay? It's a data construction, it's very labor uh, intensive, time consuming, so we're constructing this data set for other provinces as well, but it's taking us actually quite a lot of time. Okay, so um, what is inside the data set? Um, essentially, it's a de facto census of Kazakh population uh, with highly detailed surveys containing more than 80 questions about things like uh, composition of family, the behavior, um, organization of production, consumption patterns, and so on. In addition, and it's very useful for us, they also have clan genealogical maps uh, and geographic maps as, as um, annexes, as appendices. Um, so um, these are the data that we use. So we will focus in particular on the extended family composition data, clan identifiers, uh, organizational production and labor allocation. Um, so now let me give you a little bit of a context about the traditional structure and its role. Uh, it was a subsistence economy based on herding with the livestock as the main source of wealth and food. The problem of the uh, um, steppe or, or, or of the arid and semi-arid areas is that uh, in summer, steppe provides enough resources to, uh, as, as food for, for animals, but it's extremely harsh conditions in winter. So the solution that was found by, by nomadic pastoralists is to go in the summer to the steppe in large groups and then go back to the areas which are more protected from, from, from wind and from, uh, with slightly warmer temperatures in winter, and the winter pastures are the uh, scarce resource. Um, so this is probably the most important slide of my part. Uh, this is the social structure, traditional social structure. So essentially, uh, if you look below here, the individual households um, have only private ownership on, on livestock. They don't have private ownership on land. Uh, several uh, individual households compose what we call an extended family. And this extended family is a de facto owner of the land on winter pastures. Okay? Families belonging to different extended, uh, sorry, uh, people belonging to different extended families move in summertime, towards the summertime, jointly uh, as, as a clan to the summer pasture. However, in winter, they're located in far away distance from each other, okay? Now, we, inside the clan, you also have subdivisions, so clans and subclans and so on, which then compose the tribes and hordes. 
Okay? We'll be essentially focusing on changes happening at these two levels of the social structure. Good. So, two words now about uh, Russian settlement colonization, and then I leave the floor to Katrin. Uh, it happened in two ways. So the first wave was a military one. It started with the building of the Yaisk or Uralsk in 1613, and it ended by 1865 as, as the fall of Tashkent. So it was essentially a um, Cossack military that occupied a part of the land in, al along these lines. Um, it was small in proportion uh, to the local population. It did transmit some of agricultural technology, in particular hay making for the animals, uh, but it didn't create massive increase in land pressure. Land pressure started to increase from 1870s at the second wave, so peasant settlements, and it's a huge population inflow. So numbers are about two million migrants from Euro European part of Russia settled in Kazakhstan in this second wave period. Um, so this is, you know, just figure to show you this. So this is Russian settlements in Kazakhstan around 1900, and in 15 years this goes from this to this. So it's really massive increase in these northern, western, and, and central parts. Okay. So uh, what is happening during this period of settlement? Um, the trans traditional transhumanist routes of Kazakhs are getting blocked, so therefore, and, and some of the pasture lands gets occupied, so therefore it's impossible to maintain the, the, the extensive nomadic pastoralism as before. The solution that nomads have for this is to uh, shorten their transhumanist uh, periods and partly sedentarize. But that, that, of course, creates more tension in their winter pastures. Okay? Uh, in part, this is facilitated by agricultural technology, which is learned from Kazakhs earlier. Okay? Um, so, what we see in the number, in, in the data, is that there is a massive increase in the share of households that make hay between the two waves, and also the share of households cultivating crop, uh, um, and there's a clear geographic gradient. So the further away you're from, from the frontier, this, the weaker is this effect. Okay, so for example, for the two provinces, so for Kustanai, which is probably the one which is most touched by the, by the first wave, by, by the waves of, uh, of migration, is it goes from 80 to 90 percent across two waves, and in the Petropaul province, it goes from 24 to 44. So these are very sizable effects. Okay? Good. Fine. Now. So as Gany just uh, explained to you, we document four dimensions of changes in, these, uh, in the family, in institutions at the family level. So first, residential arrangements, both at the winter stop, so at the level of extended family, and at the level of the group of extended families sharing uh, summer pasture that are typically are from the same clan. Uh, there's a, also a sizable cha change in clan identity, and then in the way uh, production is organized within these extended families, in particular regarding property rights and labor market contracts. So what, what do we observe in terms of the change in the residential arrangement? So this is comparing the first expedition to the second expedition, meaning within 10 years. So the average size of extended family increases, and this increase in the size of extended family, meaning the group of households that are sharing the same uh, winter stops, is driven by an increase in the number of households, households at that winter stop. So you see here, using data from um, the, the province for which we have the match panel, the match uh, where we can actually match extended family across surveys, you see the change in the cumulative distribution of the family size expressed in population and in the number of households. However, the household size is remarkably constant. So you see the average number of people per household had not, has not really changed. Uh, so I'm not sure how I go back. Sorry, I'm going to try to avoid going ahead of myself. Okay, and using the panel data, we can also see that, I mean, we argue that this increase in the size of extended family is probably driven by a reduction in what we call natural splits, meaning extended family, when they reach uh, uh, too large of a size, they probably part of the family probably leaves the winter stop to go and uh, found a new winter stop. This, is, this seems to be happening at a much slower pace uh, in the second wave. Uh, simultaneously, the um, size of the transhuman groups, so the, the size of these, the, this group of extended family the, uh, that is meeting for the, in the summer pasture is decreasing. 
So we have a, an increase in the size of the extended family, but the number of extended family that are going to migrate together is actually decreasing quite a lot within the these 10 years from an average of five to an average of 3.5 extended families. And the, um, uh, these uh, family heads in the, during this survey were also asked to name the clan. And it, very interestingly, in the second wave, the number of clans that appear in the data has increased uh, quite a lot, and the average size of the clan has decreased to the, in the same proportion as the size of these uh, commune, this group of extended family meeting for the summer has decreased. So from an average to five to about 3.5 extended family. So those are changes in the, uh, basically in the social structure that are happening very quickly. And in parallel, what we observe in this data is uh, massive important changes in the organization of production within these extended family. And we can see this uh, in two dimensions. Uh, we can see that on the way people organize haymaking and in the way they cultivate. So basically, haymaking uh, used to be, or oh, is more likely to be organized by the, um, uh, jointly by all households of the extended family, who basically are gonna uh, cut hay on plots that are, that are jointly operated, if you want, by the group of households uh, within the extended family. And in the second wave, we observe that an increasing number of extended family have divided hair plots into individual property at the household level. So basically the data, the, precisely what we know is whether an extended family exploits hair plots jointly, whether it's fully individualized, or whether there's an intermediary form where it's individualized, but there's a yearly reallocation of hair plots. And throughout provinces, we see a decrease in the probability that uh, hair making is collectively organized. I'm gonna show you the figure in a moment. Then, the other, uh, the, other, the other variable that we can use to document this individualization is, not on the, uh, is related to labor allocation. And this is for cropping. So what we observe, yeah, so household um, extended family were asked how they allocate labor for crop cultivation. And in particular, they were asked whether uh, all household put the labor force together to jointly uh, cultivate some uh, extended family plot, or whether this was done at a, a household level. And the joint crop cultivation uh, is much less likely in the second uh, wave of data, and it gives way to individual uh, uh, cultivation at the household level. And quite interestingly, at the district level, we observe a strong correlation between the increase in family size and the decrease in the importance of uh, collective production. So I just want to uh, focus on one table. I have many tables. I'm not going to comment on all of them for the sake of time, but we can come back if you have questions. So here you see for the various provinces where we have data for the decrease in the third column on the probability that haymaking is common at the extended family level in the first uh, wave and in the second wave of data. For crop production, we only have the data for the, these two last provinces, and you see the same trend of a decrease in uh, uh, collective production. So the last dimension of change is this labor market development. So it seems that as the share of households using collective production decreases, the reliance on hired labor uh, for uh, haymaking and crop cultivation actually increases. So we observe that households are less likely to put the labor force together or, or fam extended family to put the labor force together for cropping and haymaking and more likely to, a to engage in a monetized labor contract whereby the higher labor uh, to, to perform these, ta these tasks. And uh, so simultaneously the share of households supplying labor increases and the type of contract that seems to dominate also change over, uh, over survey year. Basically, um, uh, uh, workers are much more likely to have yearly contracts in the second wave of data relatively to shorter term contracts than in the first year. 
And this level of this agricultural labor activity is in, stark con in striking contrast with the situation among farming households in Russia. So we have data, I mean, Sharyanov in his book uses data uh, for the same period in Russia collected in a very similar way. It's the same statisticians basically uh, that had did um, uh, the data collection in, in uh, Russia. And he shows that more than 90% of uh, farming households in Russia are relying exclusively on own labor to farm. So the situation, the, the uh, difference with Kazakhstan is quite st uh, striking. What we argue is part of this difference may be explained by the fact that these labor contracts in Kazakhstan are embedded within the extended family in the sense that uh, very often uh, it's basically the poor household of the ex extended family supplying the labor towards the richer uh, unit from the, um, uh, from the ex same extended family. So in most extended family, there are both household hiring in labor and household uh, supplying workers. Uh, so I just want to show you, uh, yes, so here you see the correlation, the wealth gradient basically in uh, labor market participation. So you see the level of uh, labor market participation, whether supplying or uh, demanding labor by the level of wealth. So each bar corresponds to a wealth category. It's expressed in, house, in a horse equivalent. Um, and within uh, extended family, you actually have great wealth heterogeneity. So here you see the distribution of wealth across households this is in blue, and uh, the distribution of wealth uh, across extended family in, um, in uh, yellow, in orange, and you see that there's greater wealth heterogeneity within extended family, basically, than across extended family. And um, this type of labor exchange uh, in uh, taking place that are monetized, we know that they are monetized within extended family, are basically um, appearing uh, in a context where households were used traditionally to using some type of labor exchange that have disappeared at the time of the survey or nearly disappeared, but that were, and that it was more about entrusting livestock to other relatives from the same extended family. But basically these households are used to exchanging uh, labor. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, yeah, but okay. So how do we make sense of these, uh, these various changes that we observe. So this summarizes a little, uh, this summarizes uh, graphically our story. So as Gani explained, colonization led both to the um, technological change. So agriculture, the plow, haymaking becomes uh, available in Kazakhstan and increasing land pressure. Tremendous increase in land pressure very quickly uh, we observe a technological change in, uh, in the uh, production of these, uh, production of these uh, Kazakh family. Uh, so cultivation and haymaking are becoming more important and the reliance on transhumans to feed the livestock is, is decreasing. We observe also uh, changes in the social structure and in the way production is organized. So part of the changes we observe in, you know, in the family size, uh, and in the size of the commune might be the direct consequences somehow of land pressure. If you cannot split your, if you cannot find a new winter stop, but you're gonna be stuck in the same winter stop even as uh, population growth. But we interpret other changes more the endogenous response of the, uh, of the institution to the new economic environment. And an economic theory suggests explanation uh, uh, or offers mechanism for the type of process we document here. So the, we, we are relatively, I mean, both group and, and, and Jean-Philippe, for example, propose mechanism whereby um, the organization of production at the community level uh, individualized, get more uh, individualized as demographic pressure uh, and technological change occurs. So there the story is that uh, as demographic pressure increases, increases the extensive uh, uh, production system becomes uh, unsustainable, leading to technological change and intensification and the need for better defined uh, property rights. So we argue here that we are observing this type of change at a very micro level, at the level of the extended family. Of course, it's not an endogenous uh, technological change or this could be discussed, but 
uh, we are observing this change, but also, and I'm going to stop there, we see that uh, one of our, our contribution in the fact that we show that the change is not simply happening within a given social structure, but that the social structure itself is pretty much uh, responding to this uh, new economic condition and, and amazingly rapidly because, again, these, these changes we document is uh, within a 10-year uh, period. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> You were right on time. This was about to ring. <coughs> uh, OK, <coughs> now we have the discussion. So, Ekaterina, come. See, I told you. Go ahead. You have five to 10 minutes. for that. I prepare these slides mostly to guide myself during the speech, so it's uh, not much to show here, uh, but it seems like everybody already tired, so five minutes will be okay. Um, history is a big part History is a big part of general knowledge, and uh, overall information about Kazakhstan economic history is very limited. Uh, this paper provides huge amount of theoretical and statistical information about Kazakhstan as part of Russian Empire from uh, 19, uh, 18, uh, 1896 to 1910. So the importance of traditional institutions have been shown in a highly diverse context uh, by many researchers across countries and over time. This paper presents evolution of uh, traditional uh, social structure and role of economic factors behind such evolution. Uh, this research throw light on um, unstudied traditional family institutions, uh, in case of this paper, Kazakhstan as part of Russian Empire, uh, adding more knowledge uh, of Russian colonial he economic history which is great for understanding uh, the differences of vast amount of different provinces uh, and variety of its structure. Um, paper provides great literature survey. Uh, authors using new data, which is always a great thing. Data extracted from statistical materials uh, collected uh, by the two waves of Russian colonial, uh, colonial expedition into Kazakhstan. Um, also authors in the paper, all, uh, authors provide evidence that correlation between variables from the two data sets, uh, two waves uh, of surveys is very high, um, confirming the quality of the in addition, the annexes uh, to the expedition data contain uh, genealogical trees that link clans and uh, extended families in a data set, which is unusual and pretty unique data. Uh, well, some things came to my mind while I was reading this paper. Uh, these are also suggestions for broaden discussion, and I believe that it's many ways to broaden the discussion. So, um, author is talking about Russian migrants and waves of Russian migration to Kazakh steppe. Uh, as far as I remember, the biggest wave of migration happens much later. It was in communism time um, and even later. Uh, you saying that Kazakh economy based on subsistent nomadic pastoralism and livestock was the center of nomadic uh, Well, there is no doubt in that. Uh, but you also saying that Russian settlers, uh, settlers increased land pressure. Uh, they were stopping clans on their usual pastoral trails. Uh, but in the same time, you're giving numbers of settlers in the paper, and you're saying that it's not more than 10% of total population. 
So the question is, is that could really increase land pressure? So um, the second thing which came to my mind was uh, labor market. You're talking about changing uh, uh, changes in labor markets. It is became more and more profitable to work somewhere outside of your clan or commune um, or aul, uh, rather than use kinship employment. Um, here, it w uh, I think here would be great to add some information on the wages in this region and even better to compare uh, wages with our Russian regions, probably with close Russian regions like Euros uh, or Russian South. Uh, I even have some suggestion about where to take uh, data on wages uh, because like, literally three days ago, uh, I saw one interesting data source for Asian regions of Russian Empire uh, for, for um, uh, agricultural wages. Uh, another thought, uh, authors given very detailed information on kinship institutions, but they are always a part of traditional uh, societies. These relations still are very big issues in uh, different Russian regions, like Russian South, for instance, or Tatarstan. So, um, I think it would be really representative to compare uh, Kazakhstan with Russian South. I mean, uh, Russian South uh, Kafkas, the territory between Caspian and Black Sea. Uh, these territories provides um, uh, provinces are very far apart from Kazakhstan, uh, but in the same time, the situation uh, in that time was pretty similar, so it would be very interesting to look at that uh, from this point. So uh, also another thought, uh, another thought, changing of property rights. You talking about changing of property rights. Uh, it would be interesting to add some information about property rights uh, for Russian settlers in the same time. Uh, because you were talking not about legal property rights, so more like kinship rights. Uh, so I'm sure it's many, many ways to broad the discussion, but you also told me during the lunchtime that it's just the beginning of your project, so you'll work on that. And generally, I think that the paper is very, very promising. I had a very good time uh, while I read that. And um, it has straightforward argument, which is follows without losing track. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions by the floor. Who would like to make comments or questions? Yeah, there are two. Thank you. I have a question to you. Thank you very much for your paper. I enjoyed a lot your presentation. So you, it's obvious that there was a huge changes uh, in the Kazakhstan in, the, in, uh, in, the, in this period of time, and you link them to the colonization, uh, to the Russian colonization. But uh, uh, I would like to, to, I would like you to talk more about the, the mechanism because, uh, despite the, just on top of colonization many things happened at the same time. First of all, railroads were built. And basically this, uh, uh, this area were landlocked, landlocked before that. So what you observed might be not connected with uh, the colonization at all, but just with market development and uh, regular economic incentives which markets uh, brought into the region, the development of markets brought into the region. Uh, this is so, so it is testable hypothesis, and I think you 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 have data to distinguish between decolonization uh, and uh, rail ro railroad construction. And another suggestion, uh, I think that it's the, this period, uh, so, so Russian Empire, uh, from uh, from the research point of view, is very nice laboratory because it provides a lot of geographical difference in terms of legislation. So uh, different provinces had different legislation within the same empire. And my understanding, this is true for, this, for the Kazakhstan as well in, the, in this period of time, 
and there were a number of shifts, uh, changes, important changes in legislations for particular provinces in this region. So you could distinguish between formal institution which the state uh, suggest, uh, su uh, suggested to the local population from a kind of I don't know, informal institutions which mi migrants brought with them into the, into, into, into the region. So thank you. Thank you. Please try to be short and concise. So, thanks. That, that was super interesting. So, I, uh, yeah, it seems very, very promising. Uh, I just have one uh, very quick question about the treatment, which is uh, settlement. And then um, how much conflict was there, uh, even just at a, at a very minor level? So this is very common when you have uh, sed sedentary populations with pastoralists. Uh, and, and then particularly was the change in... Uh, of, of land moving from uh, grazing to, to agriculture. So how much local level conflict was there, even just minor tensions in, over, over land? Uh, and and what is that, was that important? And should we think of that as part of treatment? Um, and so that would be just something that, that I'd want to know more about. And then moving forward, I guess also, uh, then the uh, indigenous, pe indigenous people to the area uh, did the effects matter depending on when, whether they switched or not? So you have this very micro level data. So if an, if an individual or a family or a region switched uh, you know, uh, to being sedentary, are the causal effects of treatment different than if they didn't? And so, and, and I think that'll start to tell you whether it's actually the settlement or it's something else, the conflict or, or yeah, so what exactly is going on? Thank you. Bob? Yeah, <clears throat> it's uh, quite fascinating and uh, it seems to me sort of remarkable that uh, the system of property rights was uh, never a fetter on the development of the productive forces in uh, your story. And uh, I wonder if you could speculate more on why that's so, because it seems quite unusual. It doesn't appear to be, it seems to be like a nomadic mode of production at the beginning without any kind of um, exploiting class. Is that a feature of the story? Is it the absence of a state? Uh, and legally enforceable rules uh, that means that uh, you have such rapid responses of uh, institutions uh, to uh, technological changes. Okay, maybe two last questions. We won't have time for more than two. Okay. Okay. No, no, just, just a short question too. Is uh, you know this finding that uh, labor exchange has been transformed into a labor contract or wage relationship within an extended family network is a is a very provocative kind of uh, finding. Uh, personally, I find it extremely difficult to imagine the emergence of a labor market without uh, uh, competition. And I think your finding is consistent with the fact that at least there is an exit opportunities where they can go, but the family is able to retain their member in a kind of labor exchange system, but by paying wage, because if they don't pay wage, they would go. Okay, last two, Avner. So I wonder if you... I wonder if you can make better use of comparison with, uh, with this Russian, both the immigrant and the non-immigrant. For example, the Cossacks, did their, we think Kazakhstan, were the mode of production similar to that of the indigenous people? Similarly, the comparison with the household with Russia, was it comparison conditional on the use of the same production, this means the hay and so on and so forth? So simply those are the variations might be interesting. Similarly, with respect to the end results, that means at what time, at period of time, they stop produce hay and what happened then? Because in some sense, it's not so clear to me whether this change was in the system, the social structure itself, or just in its manifestation and its expression. So if you look at later periods, for which presumably you will have good uh, bet data, even better than the excellent ones that you have, it will give you an indication whether in the long run indeed this led to the dissolution of the clans or not. Or, yeah. Okay, last comment, very, very short. Yes. Uh, I was wondering how much of these clans uh, beco becoming less important and more in the local family is due to longer migrations being harder because there's farmers blocking the way for these longer migrations. So much is the technology and even if the size of the population is small, they might be blocking some very important paths. So this could be also part of it. Okay, thank you very much. Gani and uh, Catherine, you have uh, one minute each. <laughs> 
to answer all these points. Thank you for all these great comments. Uh, so I can just choose the easiest. Um, no, maybe one thing uh, over conflict and land. So we don't have a, um, um, ver we don't have data or informa direct information on this, but the word definitely the report of conflicts, uh, very harsh conflicts across actually Kazakh lands. So there's, uh, there's really evidence that the increase of, you know, uh, cases reported to court, etc., to the uh, local justice system was increasing tremendously. And you're right, actually, so the, Ru the Russian peasant settlement, the biggest, I mean, the biggest problem was that they were blocking the old trend. Even if the number are not that, uh, large, the uh, percent of, uh, as a percent of the population, it seems that really they had completely to change the, the, the nomadic route. Um, Jean-Philippe, you are completely right about this question of exit opportunity. Actually, so in the paper, we, we, we detail this point uh, quite a bit. Uh, we have evidence both for labor contract within extended family and across. There are also um, going beyond extended family is quite key to understand that uh, uh, this, this labor um, market emerges. Um, you, yes, and just on, the, on our to-do list, we want uh, indeed to, to try to be a little bit, I mean, I'm not sure we will ab ever be able to really have a, a, a great identification, but at least to, one thing we can do is to link the change to the distance to peasant settlement. Uh, and so we, we did this at the um, uh, district level, at the Volos level, and it's quite clear that uh, all these changes are very correlated to the average distance to Russian peasant settlement. Um, but yeah, we, we, we should try definitely to, to distinguish between uh, other stories like uh, railroad construction. Gani? Gani? I just wanted to thank all, all, all the suggestions are great. It's, it's also the Katya's were excellent, and I think uh, so. Just a quick comment on on on, on Bob's question concerning this um, um, rapidity of change because of the absence of state. It's true that this was a situation where a lot of things were regulated by by custom, uh, and uh, it's very interesting to see how the enforcement mechanisms were working. So. Customary justice was present there, and they had some mechanisms of inflicting punishment on those who didn't, um, uh, who, for example, broke uh, the land regulation among, uh, among uh, tribes and clans. Uh, uh, and, but they were definitely not functioning very perfectly, and there's a lot of examples of imperfect functioning of the system. So probably there was, you were absolutely right, there was a big margin of, of adjustment to start with, and that's why we see that this is uh, such, a, uh, such, a, such a quick one. But I think this is a general point about the traditional system, the traditional institutions, in the absence or very weak role of the state, potential margin of adjustment of the system is actually bigger than we initially thought. At least this is true for us, maybe also for, for other researchers. Thank you. Okay, we have to move on because I just realized that there were not...